weird such a
And my love is fairer than any. Red as the rose, as the yonder garden grows, fair is the lily of the valley. Clear is the water that falls from the bowl, and my love is fairer.
Dusk has drawn and the green man's thorn is wreathed in rings of fog. She I sing my love to you. Place where I am lost. 
Well, a hearty good morning to all of you here and those of you watching online. Uh, for first timers, probably some of you watching online on the Sunday closest to or on St. Patrick's Day, uh, we celebrate the Celtic Christian tradition here. We've been doing it for a number of years. The, uh, the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, East and West, uh, has a lot of diversity. Probably the most diverse are the Eastern churches, the Eastern Orthodox, the Coptic churches of Africa, the Syriac churches of the Middle East, uh, Nestorian, Armenian, uh, and certainly the Martoma churches of Southeast India and Sri Lanka that trace their origins all the way back to, as the name implies, St. Thomas. Here in the West, um, if a Protestant or a Catholic, uh, the similarities are, are pretty obvious. Uh, we're not as distinct as the East. But within the Western Christian tradition, uh, the Celtic tradition is perhaps the most distinctive with the, with the music and the number of writings of the ancient saints. Um, and perhaps that is due to the isolation of where the Celtic peoples were in far northwestern Europe. And so when we speak of the Celtic Celtic Church or the Celtic Christian tradition, we speak of uh, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, the Isle of Man, Brittany, and some would also throw in the Channel Islands. Um, all those areas were Romanized, uh, you know, after about the fourth or fifth century, uh, but the Celtic tradition remains strong, and music is certainly part of it, and this service would not be what it is without the music, and our guest musicians are, are, are deeply marinated in the Celtic tradition. I want to thank Sarah Fouts, our harpist and organist today, uh, her daughter, daughter Laura Gray, and Laura Gray's daughter Alice, vocalists, and Stephen Holder, um, our bagpiper today. So uh, thanks to all of them, uh, and hey, let's give them another round of applause. One other detail, um, there is an urn here marked uh, uh, Ukraine ICRC. We are receiving contributions to the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is doing uh, fantastic work, uh, overwhelmed with the refugees uh, coming out of Ukraine on the borders of, uh, of Ukraine uh, and Eastern Europe. So if you care to make a contribution to a well-known and very accountable organization to help Help there that's available for you um, I think that's it so with that let us worship God behind me, Christ before me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my left, Christ on my right, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I arise, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort me and restore me. 
Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me.
May the High King of Heaven, with Jesus his Son, have mercy upon us. May all that dismays us and fills us with fear be cleansed and forgiven. And in the power of the Spirit, may we never be separated from the love of God, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Hear now from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, become imitators of me and watch those who live this way. You can use us as models. As I have told you many times and now say with deep sadness, many people live as enemies of the cross. Their <coughs> lives end with destruction. Their God is their stomach, and they take pride in their disgrace because their thoughts focus on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven. We look forward to a savior that comes from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform our humble bodies so that they are like his glorious body, by the power that also makes him able to bring all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and miss, who are my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. God's word to us this day. Praise God, who's still speaking. Sunday of Lent is from Luke, the 13th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. Some Pharisees approached Jesus and said, go, get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus replied, go tell that fox, look, I'm throwing out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will complete my work. But I need to travel today, tomorrow, and the next day, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. How often I've wanted to gather your people just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want that. And so now look, your house is abandoned. I tell you, you won't see me again until the time comes when you say, blessings on the one who comes in the Lord's name. God's word to us this day. Praise God who's still speaking. Let us affirm our faith together in the words of Patrick. There is no other God. There never was and there never will be than God the Father, unbegotten and without beginning, the Lord of the universe, and his Son, Jesus Christ, whom we declare to have always been with the Father and to have been begotten spiritually of the Father in a way that baffles description before the beginning of the world, before all beginnings, and by him are made all things visible and invisible. He was made human, defeated death, and was received into heaven by the Father, who has given him power over all names in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge to the Father 
that Jesus Christ is the Lord God. We believe in him and look for his coming as judge of the living and the dead. He has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us in abundance, the gift and guarantee of eternal life, who makes all who believe children of God and heirs with Christ. We acknowledge and adore the one God in Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> somebody who walked right into trouble no matter how many people said whoa look out you sure you want to do that anybody ever said that to you Luke says Jesus and his disciples are walking to Jerusalem when some nervous Pharisees run, run up to warn Jesus oh get away from here Herod wants to kill you the same Herod who lopped off John the Baptizer's head during a dinner party, no less. Well, the Pharisees have good reason to be concerned. Jesus even more so. Anyone who would cut off somebody's head between dessert and after dinner drinks would certainly find a way to make sure that Jesus didn't get out of town alive. So the Pharisees tell Jesus, you better get out of here. Now, isn't that interesting? Pharisees, who've been popping out of bushes as Jesus and his guys pick grain on the Sabbath, embedding themselves in the crowds, just looking for Jesus to break some religious law, spout some false teaching, welcome a bunch of foreigners, touch unclean, bleeding women, and heal some Roman officer's boy so they can trap him or get him killed. Now suddenly, they're his besties who want to save him? Really? Why do they care? Well, if they really want Jesus dead, why bother to warn of Herod's wrath? 
Just let Herod take care of him. Problem solved. But the truth is, if Jesus gets to Jerusalem and Herod takes care of him, where does that leave the Pharisees? Well, in big trouble, that's where. How come? Because while the Pharisees hate Herod and hate the Romans who own Herod and Jesus and anyone else challenging their position and control, Herod sees any trouble among the Jews, Jesus, Pharisees, temple priesthood, whoever, as a major threat. And Herod, if he knows anything, he knows how to handle major threats. Jesus is not fooled by their concern. Looking them straight in the eyes, he says, you guys, tell that fox, Herod, I'm kicking out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I'll wrap things up. Besides, y'all know darn well it's not right for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. In other words, my destiny is to die in Jerusalem. And woe to anyone plotting against God's purpose for me. So, when those foxes, I mean Pharisees, tell Jesus, go, get out of here. Jesus stays true to his calling when he says, I'm going to Jerusalem to be rejected and killed, but I will be raised on the third day. To Pharisees who want to save their skin and their authority, and to disciples out of sincere love and concern don't want Jesus to go to Jerusalem and get killed. He says, nothing and no one will stop me because he knows who and whose he is. Just as the Holy Spirit came upon him and the Father spoke from heaven at his baptism and at his transfiguration, you are my beloved son, in you I take delight. That truth gave him strength to stand firm and to speak clearly. When, right after his baptism, he's tempted to buy the people's loyalty with bread, rule the world as the devil's puppet, show his stuff by jumping off the temple and miraculously surviving the fall. Jesus falls for none of it. He knows the truth. He knows who, whose he is, and he will not let any challenge, any danger, take him off the path that his father has laid out for him. See, knowing who and whose you are in Christ gives you strength to stand firm and speak up for truth in ways you could never imagine. How many times did Martin Luther King Jr. and countless others in the civil rights movement march into water cannons and billy clubs and snarling police dogs as the foxes of their day firebombed their churches and homes? People told them to stop, give up the struggle. Some sincerely feared for the safety of those in the movement. Others were more foxy, masking their own fear of what change would mean for them and what privilege they might lose. Or if they really did agree with King, afraid of the consequences for saying so publicly. What if, what if King had actually listened to those who urged him to stop, begging him to get out of Birmingham, Selma, or Jackson? Might have lived a long life, died peacefully in bed, but where would our country be? 
Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was born to Jewish parents and grew up cherishing the stories of his grandparents who were killed in the Holocaust. After an early childhood in Mongolia, his family returned to Ukraine where he would earn a degree in law and economics. But he had a gift for comedy. And at age 17, he entered a competition and won, opening what looked like a successful career in stage and the movies. Destiny had other plans. He became increasingly involved in groups challenging government restrictions on artists. And after a film of him went viral, ranting against government corruption, a failing economy, and the ruling parties messing around with elections, a popular movement persuaded him to run for president, the office which he won in 2019, the first Jewish person to ever hold the office. But his reforms and prosecution of oligarchs irked the Russian government of Vladimir Putin. And the rest is current history. <coughs> Certainly with his talent, he could have stuck to comedy and made a pile of money in the movies. And like other Ukrainian and Russian money bags, retired to the sunny sky and warm, warm waters of the Maldives Islands. But he felt a call to serve his people and to bring Ukraine more deeply into the family of accountable, free, and democratic nations. Some, of, some observers even thought he would use his recent trip to Munich to address the European Union to save himself and not return home. But he didn't. And neither he nor the world will be the same. If Patrick at Ireland had given in to hatred of the Irish, who had taken him captive as a young man and sold him into slavery, if he'd marinated in self-pity and stewed in plotting revenge, or listened to family and friends who told him, you're crazy to go back there. The history of Ireland and a significant part of Western civilization would have been quite different. Because like Jesus and those who spoke his truth to the lies and power of Herod's ilk and the foxes of every time and place, Patrick stepped into danger armed only with the words and promises of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to show the people who had enslaved him a better way. And he did it because he knew the truth of who and whose he was, a beloved child of God in whom the Father takes delight. So what if... What if God might be calling you to be more daring, moving you to step up and speak out or support those who do? What if you let Christ work in you, get you closer to him, lead you to where he wants you to go with strength and grace to follow his lead? See, the truth is, this side of heaven, our faith, by that I mean our relationship to Christ and his truth, will always be challenged. The challenge can be obvious, even dangerous, as it often was for Jesus, Martin Luther King, Zelensky, St. Patrick. Or the challenge may be more foxy, through the well-meaning concern of our closest friends or family. Peter, who told Jesus, Lord, this can't happen to you. Or your spouse says, you really think God is calling you to quit your job and work for the church? Seriously? Or your own fear gets you thinking, come on now. You really feel?
feel that God is leading you to do this, and then you can sit down and come up with a thousand reasons not to do it. See, today Luke shows Jesus grieving. Oh, Jerusalem, killer of prophets and abuser of God's messengers. How often I've longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you refused and turned away. But Jesus won't turn away. He'll walk straight into town as defenseless as a hen in a den of foxes to show the world Herod's way of power and oppression and foxy ways of lies and manipulation are not God's ways. Oh yeah, Herod and the foxes will have their day. They'll nail him to a cross and say they'd seen the last of him. And we cannot foresee the future of Volodymyr Zelensky, Ukraine, Russia, and the world. But on the third day, God gets the last word. Christ is risen. The hen will live, and she will gather her scattered chicks under her wings. God always has the last word, not just for Jesus, but for us all. And that word is always life, eternal life with him. Make no mistake, the foxes will challenge the truth of who and whose we are in Christ and the path he calls us to follow. As Paul says in our second reading, there are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, trying to get you to go along with them. But there's far more to life for us because we're citizens of heaven. And we look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own, with the same power he will use to bring everything under his control. That's the truth and hope we need to walk boldly into the realm of foxes, whoever and whatever they are, walking humbly with God and speaking truth to lies, assured we know how the journey ends. Because as Jesus said, today and tomorrow, God is at work in our lives. And God's work God's work isn't wrapped up for us until he comes. Not as a mother hen this time, but as a victorious Lion of Judah to open his book of life and make all things new. In the name of Jesus. Your child Jesus wept over the sins of your people and their failure to put their trust in you. And even when his enemies were breathing violence, he continued to cast out demons and heal the sick. 
Like many faithful prophets before him, he was killed, but you raised him to resurrection life. Now he makes us citizens of heaven, and we eagerly await his coming as Savior and Lord and fulfill all things under his rule. On the last night with his friends, our Lord took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them to eat, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. And after he given thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do so for the remembrance of me. Send your spirit, O God, upon the bread and cup before us, that they may be the body and blood of Jesus, the food and drink of new and unending life in him. Make us alive to your spirit, that we might always hear your voice and follow where you lead, loving and serving you all our days. As we gather at your table, we pray for Beverly Tomer, Ruth Fry, <coughs> Rob Deutsch, Brian Swinderman, Char Cheryl Miller, Diana Lamb, Dennis and Tracy Kolstadt, the people of Ukraine, and others for whom we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God's gifts for God's people. Take, eat, and drink with thanksgiving.
Let us pray together. Lord, may we be wakeful at sunrise to begin a new day for you, cheerful at sunset for having done our work for you, thankful at moonrise and under starshine for the beauty of your universe, and in all things may you use what little may be in us to add to your great and beautiful world. Amen. and for tuning in. I want to thank our, our guest uh, musicians to Sarah, Laura, and Alice. And uh, let the cat out of the bag. Stephen told us this morning that uh, moving to Arizona uh, to uh, be closer to his son out there. So um, you're going to a warmer place, man. But thank you for your dedication to this service. It has been a joy and a pleasure and a blessing to have you with us. And may the sung response to my benediction be a blessing for you in your future endeavors. Cheers, mate. Now go in peace. May the peace of God be with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.